Hello everyone. Uh, this time around I want to talk about the process of disassembling software. Now I'm going to talk about it from a somewhat generic perspective, uh, but basically uh, it's not, well in a nutshell, it's not a, a, as mysterious or complicated a process as it might seem. It is however a lot of work to disassemble anything non-trivial. Now, disassembly is, for those not in the know, taking the binary code for a program and turning it into assembly language or a human readable representation of the uh, binary code that the computer can actually execute. The disassembly will usually involve a little bit more than just a mechanical conversion of the instructions to their mnemonic uh, representation. There will usually be some uh, symbolization uh, involved as well. Uh, replacing uh, memory address references with symbols uh, so that uh, uh, if you were to rebuild the uh, resulting disassembled code with changes then it should still assemble correctly. Uh, if you leave the constants in as magic numbers instead of uh, symbolizing them then uh, you, if you change the code at all, that changes the size of any of the code, you could very easily break everything because then those constant references will be pointing to the wrong places. So the big things about disassembly are getting, uh, are turning the uh, machine code into mnemonics that a human can understand, and symbolizing it so that it can be. Uh, modified, since generally you don't have any need to disassemble code if you don't plan to modify it later. Uh, and of course, if you have the original source code, you don't need to disassemble in the first place unless you're testing a compiler and trying to see what it did wrong. Uh, so that then leaves the question, how do you even go about disassembling a program? Well, the first thing you need to do is uh, acquire the program uh, in a format that you can read. Uh, if it's a, an executable file, then you should just need the executable file. Uh, if, if it's something that's got some sort of weird encryption copy protection, well you obviously have to remove the weird encryption and copy protection from it before you can actually disassemble it. Uh, if, it's, uh, uh, if it's on some sort of a ROM, uh, say uh, an old uh, game cartridge from uh, the old 8-bit uh, uh, days or something like that, then you're going to need to dump the ROM into a form that you can read. Uh, once you have the, the program, though, that's when you can get started. But you're going to need to know about the environment that it runs in. You're going to need to know how that file format is launched by the operating system, or you're going to need to know how the execution environment for the ROM is set up before the ROM is launched. You're going to need to know uh, the layout of an executable file format so you can find data sections and code sections and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and you're going to need to be able to find the entry point. Where does execution start when the program is launched? That's important. You absolutely have to find the entry point. And there must be a way to find it. And how you do that depends on the specific uh, environment the program is written for. Anyway, once you find the entry point, that's when you can start actually going. Now, uh, what do you do at this point? Well, uh, you, you, you play CPU, but you don't actually execute everything. You just decode it. So you start with the entry point, and you look at the byte that's there. And then you, go, oh, then you look it up in your opcode table for your CPU and you find out, okay, that's this instruction. And it takes this size of an operand, so you grab that out and you decode it appropriately for the instruction. Now that's your first instruction. Then you go on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and you just keep doing that. While you're doing that, uh, you need to keep track of all of the branch instructions and where their destination is. You also need to take, keep track of all uh, constants that are being uh, referenced. Uh, whether they're, you need to be able to identify whether they're 
uh, variable references or some random constant uh, or if they're uh, referencing a memory address that's within the code area. If it's referencing a memory address in the code area, you need to keep track of that because that will give you a clue as to whether that chunk in that code area is data associated with the code or more code. It can help you disambiguate that stuff. Uh, for variable references and so on, uh, that you're going to want to keep track of those as well so that you can create whatever definitions you need for the data section or whatever is being used to store the runtime data. Uh, so you'll need to do both of those and you'll want to assign symbols to every address that is the target of a jump or branch instruction or is referenced directly as data. Uh, typically you'll use some sort of uh, pattern to assign symbols. Uh, often when I'm disassembling for the uh, TRS-80 color computer, I'll just use an L followed by a four-digit four hexadecimal address for code references, anything in the code area, and I'll use V followed by uh, two digits for a direct page reference, and V followed by four digits or three digits or whatever for a uh, uh, extended uh, full addressing mode reference, but that's not always going to be the case. It depends on the exact uh, environment. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, I may forego leading zeros, I may not. Depends on the specific uh, case and my mood. But the key there is there's a pattern and all of these things get assigned like that. Now, that's not how you're going to keep them necessarily in the end, but you need some sort of a pattern to use before you know what these things mean, right? Until you know what they mean, you can't really give them meaningful names. So you might as well just use a generic pattern. And if you use an address-based pattern, then you have a better chance of finding things when you need to later. Uh, at least until you've fully disassembled everything. Now, what you do is, as you're disassembling, you, you keep going and you follow the code until you get to a point where the code would not proceed any further. And then you check your list of branch destinations. If there's a branch destination that's immediately following where that next byte to disassemble is, then you know it's more code and you keep going. And you keep doing that until you run out of code in that block. And then if you've got any code references left over, you start again from one of those and then you keep going and you do the same thing. And you keep doing this until you run out of code entry points. Uh, from jump instructions, branches, calls, whatever. And once you've done that, you've got a, a several, like one or more chunks of disassembled code that you know for sure are code sections. And you've got one or more chunks that may be data, but may not be. And this is when you start uh, analyzing the code that references those sections, if any does. And if it does, then you look at what it's doing with that, if you can figure it out. Uh, you may find that some of those uh, uh, data chunks are actually jump tables, or they have jump addresses, function pointers, whatever, stored in them. If that's the case, you add those to your list of code entry points, and then you continue disassembling with those. And you keep doing that until you've either identified what all of the data does, or, you've, uh, or you are stymied and you can't figure anything else out, at which point you add the data as constant data, you know, byte data or whatever in the uh, assembly uh, code, wherever it would need to be. And you... Uh, you've got now your finished disassembly. Now what you do is you make sure all of your runtime data stuff is defined properly, uh, all of your variable references and so on, so that the assembly can actually be done. Now you have the uh, correction phase where you uh, build your, your uh, disassembled source 
and then you compare it with the original in a manner that's appropriate for the form of the original. And you keep doing that until you get a byte accurate comparison of the code. And once you've done that, the code and data in the code area, once you achieve that, uh, now you know you've got a correct disassembly. And now is the time to go through and start working out how everything works, fixing everything up, uh, maybe adding some comments, you know, things like that. And maybe uh, replacing your uh, generic symbol names with more descriptive ones uh, once you, as you figure things out. How much detail you do in this does depend on what your goal is. If your goal is just to get some source code so you can build it, well you may well be done at this point. If your goal is to have the source code so you can figure out how to fix a little thing, you may be pretty close to done at this point. If your goal is to reconstruct a source code in a way that's useful for future development or whatever, or posterity for that matter, then you may have a lot more work to do. It's all, what is your goal for the, this disassembly process? Uh, but ultimately, uh, your, the end goal you're going to end up with, if you have enough time and patience to do this, you will end up with a form of the uh, like a source form for the the program that at least has a chance of being understandable by a human and can be modified now you might be thinking that this seems like a lot of tedious work to disassemble anything non-trivial and you would be correct disassembling things is tedious and it's and even for small trivial programs it can be a lot of work so there are programs out there, disassemblers, that will take the, uh, often they'll take a regular binary file even, uh, executable file format, and they'll give you, they'll disassemble the code for you, or at least they'll give you assistance with it. And they'll, they'll do things like keeping track of the branch destinations for you, and allowing you to specify that a chunk of space is data when you know for sure that it is or specifying that you know a list of entry points when you know what they are uh, because depending on the file format there might be multiple entry points and if you know what they are then you can start disassembling from all of them and you know the more of that you can do uh, the, the better your disassembly is going to be and the uh, the tools that can do the disassembly they definitely uh, make the process a lot less tedious. At least the first pass of getting the uh, getting code that's buildable. Uh, it, it removes a lot of human typos, uh, for instance. So uh, it's not theoretically it's not terribly difficult to uh, do a to create a disassembler for any particular CPU, since obviously every instruction has to decode unambiguously, or the CPU or the CPU cannot execute it, right? So there, there are likely programs out there that will help immensely with decoding. Uh, they may even pr provide uh, graphical interfaces for guiding you through the process. I have found, however, that most of the disassemblers out there are either missing uh, critical information, they make errors in actually disassembling opcodes, uh, the, the instructions, or they handle the operands wrong, or what have you. Or you have to pay through the nose to get the uh, version that actually works. Uh, or they're tied to uh, a platform that you can't run, or they're nearly impossible to figure out how to drive them because they're written by a technical guy to solve one problem and uh, he never bothered documenting any of it and uh, all of the incantations are so arcane that nobody will under, ever understand why they are the way they are. So, uh, you know, you need to be wary of the tools as well, but they can be an immense help. And of course, you'll need tools for decoding binary formats and so on, like, uh, like ELF executables. Uh, you'll need something to take those apart. You know, whatever, you know. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of tools that can help. Uh, but one of the biggest tools that I find helps immensely in, in disassembling is good old 
a graphite stick and paper, or a pencil if you prefer, uh, because then you can make notes and uh, you can use that as your uh, as keeping track of your uh, entry points, future entry points, and so on. But uh, definitely, when you start dealing with non-trivially sized programs, uh, like you get on uh, modern operating systems where you've got pro executable files in the tens or hundreds of megs sometimes, uh, then that's where the mechanical help keeping track of addresses and so on is immensely helpful because uh, you're going to end up with a lot of jump addresses and so on, especially if your binary is statically linked and, and you've got the whole standard C library stuck in there as well. Uh, so you need to be uh, wary of what you're getting in for. Uh, you could be looking at a lot of work and, you, and for no gain. Uh, and something else that you should be aware of is uh, programs that were written in higher level languages like C uh, or C++ even or, or others uh, may give you code that is really hard to figure out and really verbose. Uh, and there will be a lot of boilerplate in there that wouldn't be there in handwritten code. And uh, being aware of that uh, may help you decode it. But there are also, uh, there's an analogous uh, process called decompiling, which will take the compiled output, like the, in this case, a uh, machine code program, and turn it into something that looks vaguely like uh, source code in uh, the original language. So uh, a C decompiler would give you an output in C. Uh, and that may actually be beneficial, especially if the program was compiled with, without optimization or with minimal optimizations. That could help immensely. Um, it could be a lot more useful than trying to do an actual disassembly. So you should be aware of that as well, that there are other things that you might do that might be helpful. Now the thing is, a, a decompilers tend to be a lot more complex and the results are not necessarily any more comprehensible than the underlying machine code would be. Uh, so really, uh, that's, that's what it comes down to is uh, what tools you use will depend on, on the job you're trying to do. If it's a small job, you might as well just do it by hand if you don't have tools handy. But if it's going to be a big job, you definitely need the tools. And it may be a case of you write your own tools uh, uh, to uh, do the decoding uh, just because it makes things so much simpler, right? Uh, because then you'll know how it works. Now, as a side note, I will say that uh, writing a disassembler is so much easier than writing an assembler uh, because you don't have to keep track of symbol tables uh, and, and use that to... Uh, decide on addressing modes and all of that because that's already been done. Instead, you're decoding it into something human readable. Now, you might still have to track symbols and code entry points and so on, but it's it's quite a lot simpler overall. Uh, because you're not parsing text, you're creating text, and it's amazing the difference that makes. Uh, although that probably suggests that I should uh, get off my butt and write a disassembler to go with LW tools, but, uh, you know, that's neither here nor there. Uh, just let me say that uh, uh, disassembling can be rewarding uh, when you figure out that weird sequence of code that you didn't, that was bugging you or what have you, but for the most part, it's going to be tedious and there's going to be relatively minimal reward. Uh, it's, it, you're not going to get a, a program like Daggereth, uh, Dungeons of Daggereth. Uh, see my Decoding Daggereth video for some details. Uh, you're not going to get code like that that's a work of art uh, very often. Uh, you're more likely going to get compiler output or just random code written by random people, right? So, yeah, don't expect massive rewards for doing this or whatever. Uh, and expect to spend a lot of time even on a relatively simple program. Anyway, uh, that's really all I have to say on this uh, for now. Uh, so I'll leave off here. Uh, I will briefly mention I have a Patreon, so if you want to support the uh, channel, you can go over to patreon.com slash lostwizard. Uh, it's there if you want to. If not, 
that's fine too. Uh, also, the usual like, comment, subscribe, share, whatever. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.